Welcome back to those who have been traveling. Uh, it's almost a year to this horrible war. We're getting there closely. And um, Jewish communities here in North America, as well as the Israeli, Israeli society, are torn, literally torn, in arguing over how to best commemorate things. Um, what may not hit the news is the fact that even though hostages are still not let loose, and many of them we know are dead, uh, soldiers continue to die. There were two more just today, and uh, four more the day before yesterday, or yesterday. I mean, we found out about it yesterday. Uh, some in the Gaza Strip, some in the north. Um, you may know the troops are amassed an entire uh, division, which is one of the largest units of the army, was moved from Gaza to the northern border, border now, which, um, and the, at the coattails of these, this operation, that um, that apparently had been planned for the beginning of any war to mess up communications, but was all about to be found out and therefore was uh, implemented. Um, we, uh, you know, one might argue that perhaps this will make things better, that, that they have less of an ability, Hezbollah, but it, of course it's sure, it certainly pisses them off. And then while, while Nasrallah, who made a speech earlier today, uh, did not say we're about to move his his he seems worn down they say um there's still no no sign of 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 totally backing away even if it's not escalation right now so every week it seems that there's something new that gives us um potentially less hope and yet i'm still going to find hope in the fact that we're studying together and we are figuring out a way to uh discuss things in a civil manner and may this the work that we do here spread to uh, the other kinds of conversations that Americans are having right now. I think everybody on the call right now is American that we'll be having toward uh, in the days leading up to the elections. Um, okay. So any any comments or questions on uh, last week or the week before, before we take a look, maybe a quick look at some of the sources that I, I, I felt like I had homework to put together about Tikkun Olam in rabbinic times, not what it became afterwards in Kabbalah or in um, uh, or in 20th century United States, but how how that term was understood in rabbinic times. Any comments or questions? Uh, David, uh, Don here. Um, I, I have difficulty placing Jesus in all of the groups of people that are in occupying the scene. Um, Samaritans, Jews, um, the Pharisees. Um, I, I don't know to whom these words in the story are being addressed and, and whether it's not clear to me um, what the leanings are to each of each individual group towards Jesus and Jesus towards them. Are you talking about Jerusalem per se? Yes, yes. And it just seems to be like a conglomeration of people, and I don't know who's who's good and who's bad. There seems to be anti-Semitism flow from from uh, the words that I read. I just yeah, well, therein lies some of the challenge, Don, right? To read this perhaps not as it's been read for 2,000 years or for 1,900 years, but to read it perhaps as it was meant at the time when it was being written around 20 years after the destruction. So any of this, any of what's happening is a, is part of a memory, a not too distant memory, but a memory of, 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 a, um, of a, tra a tra traumatic memory. Uh, what I go back to each time is that so the, that um, we we have I can't emphasize enough how central the temple was, and that at least that um, illusion of control of somewhat control of some of the Jews, those Jews that had the power, and there were a number of groups 
over some of the aspects of society in Jerusalem as the focal point, as a symbol for Jewish community. It didn't, mean, didn't necessarily affect what was happening in the Galilee, perhaps, or in other places, or certainly not in the diaspora. But in Jerusalem, with this destruction of the temple, there is a feeling of a, a great vacuum, a chasm which is opened up between the people and God. And when I say the people here, I think this is this is something that brings together, unites, and Steve, you may see this differently. And a lot of what I see, by the way, is this, you know, taking things that I've learned over the last many decades and synthesizing them. And it and, and, and could be totally wrong. It's not necessarily evidence-based. But the feeling I have is that what brings all those groups together, whether they're not the Samaritans, because the Samaritans weren't in Jerusalem. That's part of a different storyline in the gospel. But what, whether it was the Sadducees or the Pharisees or the different groups amongst each of those, whether it was the poor people that, that were looking for help, whether it was those that supported the Roman government, whether it was those that absolutely, no matter what, were terrorists against the Roman government, whether it was the people living down the road in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran with their own, own world, all those people, for them, all of them, what brought them together, maybe not in organization, but in spirit was the destruction of the temple. Because nobody wanted the destruction of the temple, right? Now, how they react to that is going to look differently 20 years into it, 20, 30 years later. And I think that we have one testimony of one author or one group of authors, uh, of writers, who, who, who are telling the story in a way to send different messages. So I don't know to be more specific than that. I certainly don't know to say who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. It reminds me when I would we would be watching something with the little with our with our children, especially with the twins. Because I did a lot more with the twins than I did with the older girls. I was uh, Sasha was away. I was a month more, and there was eight years different. And often they would ask me in a story with pictures or in a in a movie or what um, they say, "Hey, Maraim, are they the bad guys?" Are those the good guys? Are those bad guys? Just to make sure it's it's clear. I would say it's not entirely clear here. What became afterwards clear in Christianity, in many circles, if not most circles, not today, but in throughout hundreds of years, was that the the bad guys are the Jewish leadership. And that would be the the members of the Sanhedrin of the royal of, of the court. Um, at, which included both Pharisees and Sadducees, and perhaps others as well, um, and it would include um, it, it would include the the rabbinic sages who had some sort of followings around them, the ones that are perceived to have rejected Jesus's understanding of Pharisaic Judaism. I've said a number of times, and again, Steve may not agree with me on this, but for to me, it feels that Jesus is so coming out of in the Gospels is talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to his chevre, his people, his buddies, or the, the same people that studied with him or he studied with. That would be my reaction. How, how would you react differently, possibly, Steve? Well, <clears throat> I think uh, that's that's a nice riff. I, I, I don't have anything to, uh, well, elaborate on except the, the, the term eudiadoi uh, in the Greek, in the, in the uh, Septuagint, Eudiadoi is, is like the Jews, right? And, and so when we get the Jews in in the Gospel of John, Scott, modern, a lot of scholars now are recognizing this is really more accurately trans, translated the Judeans. And mm -hmm. that leadership was in Judea, right? Not in the Galilee. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one fine distinction, Don, that that I've, I'm now kind of rethinking. Shaye Cohen, I just read an old paper of his. He's one of those who believes it's it's not referring to the ethnic uh, religious aspect as much as the Judeans over and against, you know, the the hoi polloi or the the Galileans or others. It doesn't hold up perfectly, but it's it's an intriguing thought, you know. Well, the, the other intriguing thought is his own received him not that that blows my mind. I, I I mean, as we get deeper and deeper into the story and see the words and and well, who are you know the question arose in my mind: who are his own? What? You know, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that. Well, I, 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 I would I would just add one thing to that is 
what we're seeing over and over again in this gospel are the two layers, right? It's there's two layers of meaning. You've got that literal earthly, let's call it, and then kind of the the inside out meaning uh, that that can be perceived rather than conceived. You know, it's it's the uh, the faithing. It's that open heartedness that that welcomes all right that that's part of the deal and some of the judeans get it few but even in this gospel aside from its historical uh veracity or not the point is made in the narrative that those like nicodemus at the end of chapter six, seven will see that he's still kind of wrestling with this and they, the leadership, the Judeans turn on him and say, are you too doing this thing? Mm -hmm. So there is lots of pushback, but again, Don, this is in the nineties, 20 plus years after the temple. And as David said, everybody's trying to sort it out right now. And the Johannine community, I say in Asia minor rooted in Ephesus right now, by this time, we, we might say there's more Gentile Christians than Jewish Christians in that community. You know, it's, it's reaching that point where the lines are starting to harden. Thank you for that. Ajit, I think you wanted to say something. Uh, when Don was talking about his own received him not, I have always thought when I read that, and I read that several times and thought about it, but I conclude that it means the Jews did not accept him. And that when you talks about his own, John here is visualizing, uh, thinking about Jesus as Jewish rather than as anything else. And when he says his own did not receive him, He's saying the Jews did not receive him. And my sense of this has always been that they were looking at this age upon Jesus as just a Jewish prophet rather than somebody who was starting a new faith, a new religion. Yeah. Well, and also, Ajit, I, I agreed, but also remember his own family is, don't get it don't believe him early on in chapter seven. Sure. Yeah. Has, uh, so they didn't believe either. Anyway. All right. Anybody else? Um, I, I don't know if we, if, if we need to, uh, to go over the additional sources to read through them, especially uh, Matthew which was brought up last week um this this you know this vision for the for the few what 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 will justice look like in the future etc and 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 then i think as as you brought it up or somebody brought it up that the term tikkun olam uh which is known today in the jewish liberal jewish world as social justice work and activism um what you can see from mishnah gitin which is the second source on that page gitin is the collection of laws that have to do with divorce and a divorce bill, a get is a divorce bill, is that the way uh, the, 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 the Mishnah talks about things that used to happen and then changes that were made. And the reason they were made is for tikkun olam. And in this context, it's not, it, it, it's in order for the world to run smoothly. It's not politically correct. It's economically correct. It's socially correct in that it, it's, um, so if we take the last example, which is going to be the one that most people would have trouble with because of the, the uh, I left the Hebrew in there. Hillel instituted the prose bull due to tikkun olam. Hillel, um, Hillel was a contemporary of Jesus, Hillel and Shammai. Uh, I have a, a I, I studied with a, a fascinating man. I'm not in touch with him. We were in school together for many years. A German uh, convert to Judaism, a, a Protestant convert to Judaism, who um, wrote uh, what I thought at the time was an amazing paper, uh, uh, analyzing different things that were thought at the time. That was what was in vogue in the in the early '90s to talk about Q quellum, you know, the what were the original words of Jesus, and um, kind of comparing them those 
things to what our Hillel has quoted. There's so much commonality between them coming really to show they come from the same school of thought. Um, not that they're the same person or not that one copied from the other, but they came from, they drank from the same well. And so Hillel, uh, you may know that in the, in the the according to the Torah, in the seventh year, um, debts are wiped out, right? A debt is wiped out. It's called Shemitah. And um, so what happened was the rabbi saw that in the fifth or sixth year of the cycle, nobody was giving any loans because it was a it was a wasted loan, right? So what Hillel came up with was this prosbol, which is a short for the for 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 the the Greek of prosbulaten is the in front of the committee or in front of the 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 court, in front of the rabbinic court or the court of the sages. It's a, it's a legal fiction. It's an intricate legal fiction that basically says. When I lend you, I, I, I'm borrowing money from you. I'm not really borrowing from you. Um, uh, Steve gives money to the to the community chest, and and the community chest will pay him back. But community chest, not being an individual, the debt is not wiped out, and and yet the community chest lending the money to me, uh, the seven years don't apply because the community chest is not an individual either. It's a it's a it's a, for, a complicated form of legal fiction. And the reason he did this was because nobody was lending anybody any money. And that's in the words Tikkun Olam and, and the things with divorce as well to keep, keep you know, people uh, prevent situations where uh, children, misbegotten children as children that are begotten from an illicit union, not bastards in the, in the, in the traditional English sense out of wedlock. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That just sounds, what you just described is a system of banking. I mean, does, does that rule not apply to banks? Well, but, there weren't there weren't banks in those days. Exactly. I'm just saying. So Hillel just was, was the first banker. It could be. That's like saying they like to say Hillel was was the first uh, the inventor of the sandwich as well because of the at the at the seder. You know, the seder is supposed to wrap the 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 third part. You put the 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 matzah. You put maror, and they used to put the the lamb from the sacrifice on it and eat it like a shawarma. And so Hillel was the first sandwich maker as well. Yeah, he's a, he was the first of everything if you look at it that way. But yes, it's a it's a banking system which would yeah. Um, okay, so uh, and then the other thing from liturgy is in the third paragraph is something we don't um, we don't do the second paragraph of this prayer. We end every uh, communal prayer with Aleinu Shabach. It's an incumbent upon us to uh, to praise God and, and say there is no other. Um, the second paragraph reads, uh, therefore, we put our hope in you, Lord, our God, that we may soon see your mighty splendor, removing detestable idolatry from the earth and false gods will utterly be cut off, enacting tikkun olam. In other words, what is tikkun olam? That all of humanity will believe in God as Adonai, as the only God, the one God, and there will be no other eyes. So fixing the world is eradicating idolatry in this specific prayer, which is still said with those words, not in the words that I use, but in, in most congregations, including, you know, yeah, including otherwise liberal folk. And then finally, just in, in my search for tikkun olam in, in more ancient pre-modern literature, um, I found something that, that is what quite common known, but this is, this is part of being literate in the Jewish world. Jewish literacy includes this section from Maimonides, and that is, um, and, and Maimonides has the laws of kings and wars. That's the section, even though it didn't apply to him living in in uh, in Spain and then in Egypt uh, uh, as the vizier of, 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 of you know of of the ruler of Egypt at the time, a doctor as well. And he says all the deeds of Jesus of Nazareth and that Ishmaelite who arose after him. Right, that's the best that he can do, I guess. Okay, um, meaning of course Muhammad. Uh, will only serve to prepare the way for the Messiah's coming and for tikkun olam. In that same understanding, tikkun olam being eradication of idolatry, of, of polytheism, moving all to worship God together. Do not presume, and this is the part which is the most well-known part, right? Interesting enough, interestingly enough, the first two lines are often forgotten in, in Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox circles. That, that's, that part is what's what the debate becomes is what, Rambam writes, Maimonides writes after this, do not presume that in the messianic age any facet of the world's nature will change or there will be innovations in the work of creation. Rather, the world will continue according to its pattern. This being 
anti-eschatological, I guess we might say, right? This is, every Maimonides is saying, everything you read in the prophets in Daniel, in Jewish tradition, right? That's, that's not what's going to happen because he was a rationalist. He was a philosopher. What will happen is it'll be this world with the electric company, but the electric company being, you know, just in the in, in in the amount of money they charge you, and the electric company not polluting, and I just stop said the electric company, and you'll go to the store to buy your things, but people will use honest weights, and uh, uh, you know, and, and people won't cheat each other. So that brings me back to the section in Matthew, kind of right. What is this world of, of caring for each other, of care and of love, right? Okay. I love those, that that Maimonides text. The um, you know, and, and moving all to worship God together fits with what we know about that period in Cordoba, right? Where they where they were living, uh, Christian, Jew, and Muslim for a while. It seemed they were in some kind of harmony or collaborative relationship. No. That's what that's what the uh, the no. legend is, right? That that was a, a golden age of ecumenical connection. But I think what happened is that didn't the Ishmaelites exile Maimonides? I think they took him out of Cordoba and sent him in exile somewhere. But no, no, I think that uh, Maimonides left Cordoba because of the being ex expelled from from that area by the Christianity. I I, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. It was it was the church, not the. Uh, I think so, but you know what? Not my not my wheelhouse. But I but you know, Richard, I'm sure he's going to Wikipedia and he's going to let everybody know it's in. You know, yeah, I, I, I whatever it is, the Ishmaelites being the Muslims, of course, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's uh, there there are little pearls, by the way. That you know, for me, that's an this is an important source. It's a pearl mm -hmm. of of how why it's important to have interfaith dialogue and practice, by the way. Um, is that uh, in the laws in the Shulchan Aruch, which was, uh, or one, it could be one of the commentaries, that, I think on the Shulchan Aruch, Rabbi Yosef Karo in 16th century in Spot, the land of Israel, and he, there you have the laws of the daily when you get up in the morning. From when you get in the morning to when you go to sleep, there's laws of what you need to do every aspect of the day, as mm -hmm. there are in many traditions, but this is pretty laden. Mm -hmm. and, and when you put on your prayer shawl, you, you take it and you wrap it around your head like an Ishmaelite. And I always kind of like that, what they're trying to say, put it on like a kafia, like a like a Bedouin, right? Against the sun. But I love the fact that that's what, you know, one of the first things I do in the morning and I wrap myself in my talit that way, I'm doing it like an Ishmaelite. I like that. That makes me. Yeah, I was interested in Ajit's comment um, um, where he said no. Um, and I, I I'm interested because when I was in college, I took Spanish, and Cordova was uh, Cordova was was kind of discussed, and the unifying factor in um, that area was the art, the the religious art um, of all traditions, mm. uh, and that gave me a a sense that there was harmony in the place. So I. Ajit, if you have something to destroy my image of, of uh, sure. Spanish. Women. No. Uh, under Muslim rulers in Spain, there was Christian and Jewish minorities who were there, who were not being killed because they were of a different religion. Because in other places, like India, Muslims had done this, killed people who wouldn't accept their religion. They were being treated as citizens who paid extra taxes or were second class citizens. They were never ever on the same level as fellow fellow Muslim citizens. And and, and that that's really, really something that um uh, and I'm surprised by the use of Ishmaelites here, by the way. Um in, in current Quranic scholarship that is in dispute that is essentially the term that uh, it seems like muslims recreated themselves as sons of children of ishmael when there is basically um 
some thought that Muhammad made a mistake instead of saying we were from Isaac, he used the second brother instead of the first brother by mistake because so much of the Quran is a repetition of what is found in the Jewish gospel, the stories, etc. So, so first of all, Steve, I apologize. And a quick look at yes, of course, <laughs> I see he was expelled by from Cordoba by by the Muslim powers and not not by Christianity. It's, that shows my lack of knowledge in history. So I apologize for that. Um, as far as Ajit using the term Ishmaelite, that that is the term in he rabbinic Hebrew for. Uh, for I mean, it's not in rabbinic as in Talmudic Hebrew because Islam didn't uh, exist yet, but that's the term that's used. Mm, okay. Where that comes from, you know, I would imagine from Islam itself or one reading of Islam, yeah. Mm. Whether that's historically correct, that's another question, yeah. Uh, okay. Anything else? All right, so, so our job is to finish... Um, is to finish chapter seven today. And so that we don't forget a little bit of um, housekeeping, um, I will be on the road next week, but Steve is going to teach, uh, uh, lead, the, lead the study of chapter eight. Um, I'll try to get a, a sheet together quickly, probably won't have any additions to it. And, um, and then the two weeks after that are, um, uh, no, then the week after that is Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. We'll take a break. And the week after that, we'll meet together. And then the week after that and the week after that, and we'll put all this material out, are Sukkot and Shemini Atzeret, which are extremely, extremely... We actually should we should have put this off to do that in right then, mm -hmm. right? But we're preparing for it because we're coming up to the... We're, we're in Sukkot and, and, and Shemini Atzeret. We're already in Sukkot and we're going to get to Shemini Atzeret means the eighth day of of gathering, it's the eighth eighth added on day to the seven days typological number of seven days at the new moon at the uh, full moon of the month of Tishrei. It's um, not month of Elul. No, we're in the month of Elul right now. Yeah. Okay, and we and we just have the full moon or a little bit less right now, and uh, and then Rosh Hashanah is at the new moon of Tishrei where there's new, moon. and Sukkot is at the full moon because an agricultural festival like Passover. And Sukkot are at the full moon, and there was a another full moon festival that was the collection, which is now called the is uh, Jewish Valentine's Day in Tu Ba'av, uh, which was last month, and that is more of a, a full moon that that has to do with the collection of wood it did in ancient times for the sacrifices, but that's for another day. Okay, uh, so we're at verse twenty five. Um, So, uh, Steve, you want to read? Steve Byrne? Okay, maybe we have to... Am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. Oh, okay. I'm, I switched to my phone this week, so I'm it's like learning a new system. Okay. So now some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, is not this the man whom they are trying to kill? And here he is speaking open, openly, but they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Messiah? Yet we know where this man is from. But when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus cried out as he was teaching in the temple, you know me and you know where I am from. I have not come on my own, but the one who sent me is true, and you do not know him. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. Then they tried to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him because his hour had not yet come. Yet many in the crowd believed in him and were saying, when, the, when Messiah comes, will he do more signs than this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering such things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent temple police to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little while longer, and then I'm going to him who sent me. You will search for me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? 
Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will search for me, but you will not find me? And where I am, you cannot come. Okay. Rather packed. <laughs> packed. Yes. So who's who wants to start off with a question or a comment? <laughs> You get first dib, Steve, because you read. You get. Okay. You don't have yeah. to. You don't have to. Well, I, I. It's always interesting to me all of the, I guess the different views and and the, and the people, seem to be just honestly questioning, saying, "Isn't this the guy they're trying to kill?" And so they're they're looking at it. So he, he's at the market. He's speaking openly, and and it's like. It seems like they're confused, but they say nothing to him. So it's like, isn't this the guy they're after? And he's right here and he's continuing to do this, but they're not doing anything about it. And then the, this suspicion, can it, can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Messiah? So were the people seeing him as that? Is it referring to that? And now they're saying, do the authorities really know too? And why are they trying, why are they not doing anything? Either so, to take him out or to acknowledge him. So it sounds from what you're asking is that is the main problem is how does one verify for either for good or for bad if he's the Messiah? Yes. Right. How, yes. how does one how how do we go? What's the process for vetting it? The Messiah, the one who claims they're the Messiah, and and is is he claiming he's the Messiah, or only his people claiming he's the Messiah? <laughs> Don, it looks like you've got some. Yeah, words I, you know, I, um, it's like the elephant in the room here, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I want to take you back to the healing of the uh, man at the pool and the. And the reference to circumcision in verse 22, um, where circumcision was such a, an important event of a covenant, and it was done on, it's not allowed to be done on the, on the Sabbath, but yet the healing was done on the Sabbath. What struck me about this was that a part of the body was not appropriate to heal, but the whole bo part, body is appropriate to heal um, on the Sabbath. Um, and I, I, this is really where I raised the point of being utterly confused in Joannian muck about who the hell was he, who were these people in all of these groups, and you know what did they recognize? He said, I get the impression they don't know who this is, and I get the impression some of them have a perception of who it is, um, but it's it's like dense reading to me you know there there's a um there's a channel that i get on spectrum that we get out here in our, in our cable tv and maybe you get it's called it's i24 are you familiar with that that channel i24 so ajit is it's it's a it's a kind of a private news channel that that i think has been around for about 10 years it's both in, it's in french and arabic english and in hebrew uh, now it's no longer in english it's only in hebrew no, 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 no. Here on our cable. Oh, uh, on our cable. For some reason, uh, and and the Hebrew, the Hebrew version is actually far better. I think the English version is very challenging from a TV point of view. The way the Paul, the way they dress, the way they talk. Um, so it's different. It's the same owners. It's the same editorial staff, but different people are presenting the news. And one of the things they do with the Israelis. And this is why I'm telling this, Dan, and anybody who's watched Israeli news programs, or to a certain degree, Fox and CNN as well, they're a little bit more active, more clean up. When you have those panels, you know, those round tables, or the, the Israeli thing is always, it's always a crescent, right? So the, the person who's, the, who's delivering the news in the middle, there's three on one side, three on the other side, and boom. But they are all talking over each other. Nobody lets each other fit it. And this goes on. And in Israel, that's just typical. It took me a long time. It's called learn. crossfire, right? Yeah. But it took me a long time to try not to do that here. And I hope I don't do it too much here, talk <laughs> over you when, when you're speaking. But to, to me, that's what's happening here. Yeah. That's my it's, idea. It, it's, it's not helpful to faith. 
Um, by the way, it's reality. It's a balagan. You go ahead. Um, Kal Kalev Ben David still does English news every day. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is it, it's it's a cultural thing. What I feel that this paragraph reflects is a reality, a cacophony of different views, different. It it it. It, I think in a masterful way, from a literary point of view, it delivers that feeling of well, what the, like you said, what the hell is going on here? Who's talking? Who is who? I think that's intentional, Don. I well, don't know. It's, and if it's intentional. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, say? Don, uh, some people in Jerusalem, right, Jews, yeah. but they're not the Jews. And, and yet they're all speculating, like I said last week, remember, this is a... Um, from 200 uh, BCE to 100 CE, that was an apocalyptic, lots of eschatology, lots of thinking about the end times and mm -hmm. is Messiah coming and what are the signs of Messiah? So all of those questions are going on and yet as mystical literature that I think this is, this gospel, Jesus is talking here and they're talking here and everybody, these two levels of, oh. of, 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 of uh, these two kinds of ages or kingdoms are clashing back and forth. A, a question here, Steve, and perhaps the rabbi, uh, the Jewish view of end times when the Messiah comes, I guess those are the end times, was the Jewish view at that point that when the Messiah came, there would be mass destruction and everybody would die except the select few, etc. I don't know if that was necessarily the Jewish view, except uh, my sense is the Jews believed that the Messiah would be their redeemer. He would make give them freedom, not the end of the world. Well, I think, again, those apocalyptic images of the moon, you know, will not give its light and mountains fall into the sea. Mm -hmm. Imagery suggests that this age is passing away. So what we're talking about is a cataclysmic ushering in of the long awaited age to come that some say would be led or ushered in by Messiah. Others say God will bring it in. Yeah. Um, At any rate, there, there's a, a, it's not like a prophetical, it's not like a reform reformation as much as a, a complete starting over. Yeah, Ajit, you remember from uh, Second Isaiah, there were, there were not as uh, violent. It didn't feel as dark and violent, but the plowing of the uh, of move, you know, moving earth to make a way for the exiles to come. There's there's a lot of that kind of talk. Some is is more threatening. Some is less threatening. But there is no Jewish view. That's my main point, right? Yeah. There, there is a Jewish view. I mean, the Book of Joel of others, you know, eh, for pretty dark stuff. Uh, the the tradition of the of the uh, in Ezekiel, the fight between Gog and Magog. Um, all these things are still still, and they're still ever they're still left over in Judaism, by the way, because these are readings that come up in weekly Torah portions from time to time. And some of them, now to the point, some of them lead us to the holiday of Sukkot. Sukkot becomes, in many circles, a holiday that is connected to the redemption more than any other holiday. You'd think that Exodus would be the one, right? But it's it's actually Sukkot in where people talk about messianic things. Uh, and, and that, and, and we're going to have more on that when we get to the the, the final paragraph of today, which um, um, so 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 yeah. And I, another question is: in, Were there Jewish traditions that the Messiah was expected to prove himself with miracles? That goes back a little bit to what Don was asking beforehand, right? Um, and, and there is a strain, but it's not it's not a, a a widespread view. There are those that say, and historians, and some of them are non-Jewish historians writing about afterwards or church church fathers writing backwards, that the Messiah had to prove himself by showing miracles. Um, the Messiah in in script, in biblical, in Hebrew Bible, that there's nothing about the king, anything about the anointed one who's going to do miracles. The miracles are things that Moses did, that Eliyahu did, Elijah did, 
that Elisha, Elisha, Elisha did. Those are certain prophets, and and Jesus has been Jesus' character has been modeled on those prophets in many ways to kind of come look at this is the one who comes instead of those. But the miracle making in Mashiach is not a, is not a, is not a clear entirely clear except for it feels like it is here. Um, well, one, I, I would I would say there's lots of images and references in uh, uh, Esdras and Enoch and uh, uh, where the uh, the age to come will be accompanied by the casting out of the accuser, the, the evil one. It will be accompanied by healing and wholeness and restoration. Whether or not that's Messiah's criteria, they right. seem to test him continually on that. Remember, he do a sign like you did before. And he refuses to prove it in those terms on that condition. Nevertheless, it is a sign, as John would put it, for those with who, who see from the inside out, this is a sign of the age to come has broken in indeed. Hmm. Uh, although I have read somewhere that there are certain signs about the coming Messiah. A, he would be the from the descendant of David. He would come from an unknown place. He would carry a sword in his hand. Uh, so th there's certain things that, you know, I have read over time that these were the signs expected. And A, he the, the most important that he would be the Jewish redeemer, meaning drive out the Romans. Um, that was an and, aspect and, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and part of the not accepting Jesus was that he really didn't. He, we know where he comes from. They say, we know he's a brother of so and so and the um, son of so and so. Yeah, he didn't, and he didn't really fit all the criteria. Yeah, he didn't fit all the criteria. So the rejection seems to be, hey, he's not meeting the criteria we have for him. But this mysterious language he uses here about you know, where, who am I? Where, where do I come from? Mm -hmm. I think there's, for me, an inescapable connection between the wisdom understanding of, of wisdom was there at the beginning of creation with God. And then in Acts, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in Job 28, verse 12, but where can wisdom be found? Uh, where does understanding dwell? No mortal comprehends its worth. You know, a lot of that esoteric type mystical language that Jesus is using, for me, uh, is a conscious connection with, with incarnate wisdom or embodied Torah, whatever language works. Um. So we'll go on in just a second. In the background of all this is is the police that I want to take a look at. You know who are these police? We have a little bit of material about that in early rabbinic literature. But I I have a question. I guess this is for Steve. Is um, when in thirty five, um, when you know the Jews said to one another, "Where does the man intend to go? Does he intend to go to the diaspora, the dispersion, to the among the Greeks and teach the Greeks?" Is this a is this in conversation with what we read about, what we learned from Acts? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously so that it's a snarky kind of comment. It, it yeah, feels I was going to ask you whether it was criticism, but I, so I said conversation, but go ahead. Yeah. But in fact, they're in a diasporan community, right? They're, they're in Ephesus with that Jewish community that now includes many, many Gentile uh, uh, believers who have been grafted into that covenant people. You no, know, but it, it, it almost takes the appearance of Paul, that, that Jesus is, uh, is doing the same thing that Paul ended up doing, or, or at least in the thoughts of the Jews who were saying to one another, where does this man intend to go? And I thought that was, that was kind of interesting to me. I don't know how it got in there. I never thought of Jesus having... Um, uh, a ministry outside of, you know, what what we now call Israel. I, I never thought of him being in another country, so to speak. Well, and there's folks who say he went to India and learned a lot of wisdom in India. So yeah, there, 
Thank you. And there's been a lot, and there's a lot of literature that's not canonical that talks about all that as uh-huh. well. But bottom line, I think it's a snarky comment, but it's also revealing uh, what happened. You know, that's that what it, makes it because it, because there were no traditions about Jesus going out. That's what makes it so snarky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, but I thought that this might have been a, a really a late addition to this section of the gospel. That it's not saying that he did go out. It's that certain Jews are are being are sarcastically saying it. Yeah. Oh, so okay. what now? He's going to go to the moon? <laughs> you know. Okay, let's 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 go ahead, Don. Why don't you read from uh, thirty-seven? And let's let's jump into Shmini Atzeret, which today is, is that is October seventh, right? Uh, uh, that everybody should understand. October seventh last year was Shmini Atzeret, also known in Israel as Simchat Torah. In the diaspora, it's two different days. In our community, in Reform movement, uh, and in the land of Israel, it's only one day. It's the, uh, the biblically mandated eighth day of Sukkot, or additional day. Go ahead. All right, I'm reading from 37 then. On On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart, others, belly, shall flow rivers of living water. Now, he said this about the spirit, which believers in him were to receive. For as yet there was no spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Should I go on? No, no, let's, let's just talk about this for a second. A few things going on. I said the day, right, the particular day. Um, Sukkot, while... In the Torah, in, in that list in, in, in Leviticus 23 that I referred to last week or the time before, there is a commandment to take four species to hold in your hand. They became the palm frond, the myrtle, the willows, and a, an etrog, a, a citron. Uh, they were possibly very different when it was meant two of them at least were different probably in biblical times. But you took this and you're supposed to dwell in a booth and it's sukkah for, for those seven days. The eighth day, by the way, that's not commanded. You, so you don't do those things on this eighth day, but it's it's an added day onto the holiday. And you're supposed to, it says the Torah, only there it says, v'samachta b'chagecha. And you shall and you shall be joyful on this, on your holiday. And when it says the, your holiday, or the holiday, as I mentioned last time, is Sukkot. And the reason for that is that now the tension, the stress of the agricultural year is gone because everything that's been harvested has been harvested that can be harvested. And now it's a time for the farmer and all the people who want to eat to wait for the rain. So it became, although it's not stated in biblical literature, that it's the holiday upon which to pray for rain. That's what it became. And we know that from early rabbinic literature and and, and from things that happened, even you know, a story from the second century uh, BCE. There's, there's arguments as to how exactly the water, the libation of the water, the pouring out of the water in the altar, which is a sign that when you were at the thirstiest time of the year in the land of Israel in October, when the cisterns are low, you take some precious water and you pour it out on the altar to show I am full of, uh, of trust that the rains will come. Okay. That be, so that's what's about the water. So that's speci- that that gives the background for Jesus's words here about the water. And instead of people relating to the actual water, like all of the Book of John is, as as Steve said, there's the earthly level and the upper level. Is that the water? It's not about the water, stupids, right? It's the it's me. It's it's the Torah, and and I I think I mentioned before, Torah is compared with water also a very in in lots of rabbinic sayings. Um, it's the wisdom. It's the belief, it's the faith, it's, it's it, it, or according to Matthew, it's the doing better, making better in the world. It's not about the water itself. Um, we have the same thing with the eating of the bread, right? In, in the chapters before about, it's not about the manna, uh, the, that miraculous, but they, it, it's, I'm the, it's about eating me, internalizing me. Here it's drinking me, not, not as the blood, of course, the flow of living water. Um, so that's kind of what I think, uh, 
Yeah. And by the way, the the uh, uh, common term in in Talmudic literature is is those who are thirsty for Torah. Yeah. I, David, I uh, also think uh, there's there's a whole section in Zechariah 14 that seems to yeah. uh, be a source for this this understanding. It says, "On that day, uh, living water will flow out from Jerusalem." half of it east to the Dead Sea and half of it west to the Mediterranean Sea in summer and in winter. I, you know, there, there's those images of living water that, that seem to be in the background of a lot of this. In e Ezekiel 47 as well. And, and those that know what Jerusalem looks like, it's, and once you have that in, in, ingrained on your soul and you go or you live in Jerusalem or you're there every day as many years of our lives we were in that particular area, you just imagine how those wadis fill up with this gushing water coming from the Temple Mount. And in that in that prophecy, by I, I think the one in Ezekiel, I'm not, I don't remember exactly the one in uh, in Zechariah, uh, the Dead Sea becomes a sweet sea, sweet water sea, right? It's 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 healing water for and yeah. So connecting to the on that day to Shmini Atzeret, I don't know if it's specifically. I don't think it's in in the Hebrew Bible that that is on Shmini Atzeret, but that those two things were adjoined. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. it just kind of reminds me of the woman at the well too, where living water comes up as well. Yeah, the metaphor of water and life. Yeah, okay. So let's see if we can plow ahead and finish this off. Let's do uh, it. Uh, Rita Claire, forty. When they heard these words, some in the crowd said, this is really the prophet. Others said, this is the Messiah. But some said, surely the Messiah does not come from Galilee, does he? Has not the scripture said that the Messiah is descended from David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David lived? So there was a division in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to arrest him but no one laid hands on him. Want me to continue? Well, I'll just make a comment about, uh, we talked about this before, the, it can, uh, in this context, or maybe it was, I don't know, in Axis, this idea that can can, the, can anything good come from Nazareth? Yes, right. Anything good from the Galil? It's like in Texas, they would say, really? He's from Waco, Texas? Something good can come out of him? <laughs> so I just chose that. Or from here, Bakersfield, right? No offense to people from Waco or Bakersfield, but I yeah. want you to know something about Waco. It is the home of the Green family uh, reformed Jewish camp where we Baha'is rent out once a year to have uh, events there. It's the largest Jewish camp uh, in in the city in Texas. How about huh. that? So, but it's not the Green family from uh, Hobby Lobby. They're a different Green family. <laughs> I think. Uh, no, I know. So it's the same last name. Yeah. yeah. Um, and good. And the other thing that Waco is important for, of course, is is that uh, I don't remember the name of it, but the guy that that makes whiskey there. I think he's moved since then. Uh, oh, an, an amazing distillery is in Waco. I went to visit that I learned about at my cousin's house one year. Okay, mm -hmm. not relevant. Go ahead. Uh, what, okay, continue, Rita Claire. Then the, the temple police went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, "Why did you not arrest him?" The police answered, never has anyone spoken like this. Then the Pharisees replied, surely you have not been deceived too, have you? Has any of the authorities or, or of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd, which does not know the law, they are accursed. Am I saying that right? Yes. Yeah. So Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus before and who was one of them, asked, our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they are doing, does it? They replied, surely you are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and you will see that no prophet is to arise from Galilee. A little, a little Judean snobbery, I'd say. <laughs> And also, it's it's hard to follow exactly who's saying what here. I think that's on purpose. I think there's a there's a cacophony of voices going on here. So who are these these police? Who's these police? Remember, the Romans are in charge, right? 
Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I, there isn't a lot. What I found is uh, in in section number two, which is from the Mishnah, again, that early collection of, of oral material, uh, in three places, the priests keep watch in the temple, in the chamber of Avtinas, which is where they prepared the incense, in the chamber of the spark, which is where they kept whatever the fire going, so they would always have where they could light the the fires used in the in the temple itself, in, in the uh, service itself, and then in the fire chamber, which according to most commentators of the Mishnah, it is about where the priest would go to warm up because they were there twenty four hours a day doing stuff. And this whole thing is about how the priests keep watch over what's going on in the temple. That's the only. Um, reference we have. And then when you get to this section here, the second paragraph, um, the officer of the Temple Mount used to go around to every watch with lighted torches before him. And if any watcher did not rise at his approach and say to him, Shalom to you, officer of the Temple Mount, it was obvious that he was asleep. Then he used to beat him with his rod and he had permission to burn his clothes. And the others would say, what is the noise in the courtyard? Is it the cry of a Levite who has been beaten and his clothes have been burned because he was asleep at his watch? And uh, and then Rabbi Yezer, as in true Mishnaic Talmudic form, says, no, nah, I heard a little bit differently, or I heard something else. Once they found my mother's brother asleep and they burnt his clothes. And of course, the major question is, how did he get out of there without his clothes? How did he flee from the scene naked? Now, this is certainly not complimentary. I would say it's even humorous. This is, a, for me, a typical rabbinic way of criticizing something that's in the system. It's in the system. And remember, the rabbis, the sages, the Pharisees who became the rabbis and sages, they were not from the priests. They were not from, there were exceptions, but they were not from the priests. So this is their ways of saying, look at look at how strict they are. So much so that they would beat them if they fell asleep. Well, of course you fall asleep. I, others, I, I would imagine here, have been in the army as well. Oh, we all fell asleep on duty in you know in the middle of the night. Uh, and, and so... Um, I think that this is a way, of, a, a kind of a self-reflective uh, criticism of that tradition of the police there. So and it's interesting. I don't have anything else. I didn't find anything else there. I'm sure there's other stuff, but this is what I found, yeah. to, uh, which would complement, would certainly complement uh, the, the gospel according to John here, I think, and this that, you know, they're not on our side. And it goes with the, the Jews, the ones who are persecuting us. Yes, Don? I was thinking that... Um... You know, David was from Jerusalem and Jesus was from outside of Jerusalem. So there, there's some um, there's, there's some uh, dispute about lineage here, uh, where the Messiah was supposed to come from Jerusalem, and, and yet Jesus was born uh, outside of Jerusalem. So even right. though... So just to correct, it's not Jerusalem, it's Bethlehem. Bethlehem, I'm sorry. Yeah, the dispute yeah. is from yeah, and that's why you have in one of the got one or two of the gospels one of the where where Bethlehem comes into the picture right there. They had to flee Bethlehem, right, and that's why they were in the Nazareth and yeah. yeah. So, all right, well, um, so we'll send out a uh, a detailed notice about classes going forward. There will be next week. Without me, I will watch the YouTube video, as many of you have done before, and. Um, and may it be uh, uh, may it be a good week, a week of uh, a week of, of of better news, as we've been saying, and may we work towards the yearly year annual anniversary of that Shmini at Sarat, that hopefully there'll be some good news to celebrate on that day. But don't answer your beeper if it goes on. <laughs> beeper. <laughs> Can I just tell you when I the, uh, I would uh, did reserve duty for you know for, for until I was forty two, and and one year we were stationed. We were stationed in the Golan Heights, and 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 every day before you go out, the the commander, the platoon commander, or the company commander gives a uh, a prep, you know, with the maps and this and all, and we have to be there. And um, and somebody said, uh, he says, I've got to go, I've got to, but if you need me, you can get me on my bifer. And I said, oh, it, it, he was an Arab. Me. I said, no, no, he's, he's one of our guys. I said, no. I said. Excuse me, I think it's beeper. And then all the guys said, no, David, it's beeper. I said, no, it's beeper. It goes beep, beep, beep. And so, <laughs> yeah, no. one, one of my struggles. But the alphabet P, like Peter, does not occur in Arabic. So they can't okay. say, say Palestine, they say Philistine. 
Yeah, and, and it, the P, the P, and the F are are the same letter in Hebrew and in, in Semitic language. That is true. Uh, Arabs will often say uh, they'll say pizza. They'll say B pizza, um, as opposed to pizza. So the P becomes a B in some places in in Arabic, and the and the PH or the F becomes a P or P becomes F. -H. Like Butros Butros Gali, the poor guy's right. name was Petros in air in, in you know. Right, and then and. Ayin becomes a G as it did in Greek, so Aza becomes Gaza. Anyway, uh, yes, don't check your beef. All right. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you.